All right, so and welcome everyone back. This is going to be our second screencast for Chapter 16. In fact, it's going to be our final screencast for Chapter 16. And what we're going to do today is we are going to look at DNA replication. So we're going to be synthesizing or making a new DNA strand. So before we get started, remember that we had talked about several different enzymes towards the end of our last video. And we're going to look at how those enzymes are being used to replicate the DNA. Now, one thing to um, sort of realize as we look at that DNA strand is that DNA is actually anti-parallel. So this elongation is going to occur actually in two different directions. And so when we have that DNA polymerase, and so that's going to be that special enzyme that's going to add nucleotides, it's only going to add nucleotides to that free three prime end of that growing DNA strand. So it can only elongate from the five to three prime direction. So down here towards the bottom, if you look at the diagram, um, you can see the three prime, which you can see three prime right here. You can see the five prime end right here. So as we look at that, it's three prime, you follow it through. Down here would be our five prime. If you look at this five prime end, if you follow it through, over here you would have your three prime. Then of course, if we look at the opposite side, this would be three prime. And if again you follow it around, this would end up being our five prime end. And then if you look at this side, this is going to be our five prime. And if you follow it around, this would end up being our three prime end. Now that's going to be important when it comes down to replicating the DNA. So we have two different types of strands. We have one called the leading strand and one called the lagging strand. So along one template strand, remember that when this DNA untwists, each side is going to serve as a template. And if we're looking at the leading strand, this is going to be the strand that actually will replicate continuously. And so what that means is, as we untwist that DNA strand, in other words, when the helicase comes in and untwists that strand, um, we're going to form a replication fork. Each template is going to be formed. And the leading strand, it's really simple because the DNA polymerase simply comes in and it's going to add nucleotides all right, to that um, leading strand. In other words, we're going to have all of these nucleotides exposed. Those are going to be our A's, the T's, the C's, and the G's. And the DNA polymerase is going to come through and simply add the missing nucleotide. So for the leading strand, it's pretty simple. But the lagging strand, on the other hand, that's where things get a bit more difficult. So remember, we can only move from the 5' prime to the 3' prime direction, and we can only add on the 3' prime end. Well, in this case, if you think about it, this, if you look over here again, this is the 3 prime. If you follow it around, this would end up being our 5 prime. So what we can only do is we can simply add to a 3 prime in. And because of that, we have to add, actually, to this particular side of the DNA molecule, we have to add those nucleotides in segments. And so what we're going to look at here is something called a DNA primase. Now, that primase is important because it essentially dictates to that lagging strand where do we introduce that RNA primer. So an RNA primer is just a series of 10 to 15 nucleotides that are RNA in nature. And what they do is they give an indicator to that polymerase where it needs to add those nucleotides. Now the thing is it's going to add those nucleotides in segments because remember this particular DNA um, strand is untwisting in this direction. And so again with the leading strand it's simple because the DNA polymerase continues to add those nucleotides. But in this case, because we can only add to that 3' prime end, again, that RNA primer is going to indicate, okay, this is where you can actually add some nucleotides. And so the DNA polymerase is going to come through on that lagging strand. It's going to add those nucleotides. But you've got to remember the untwisting is happening in this direction. So that's going to be exposing more nucleotides on this strand. And so what will happen is that DNA primase will come back here, indicate where we need to add that primer. A new primer will be added, for example, maybe added here. But then we have these missing nucleotides that actually have to be filled in. So because of that, again, DNA polymerase comes through. It's going to add those nucleotides. And then as the untwisting occurs, it's going to have to come back further, new RNA primer, and then add those nucleotides. Now, because it adds those nucleotides in segments, we call those Okazaki fragments. And another problem that we have because of these Okazaki fragments is this area right here. And you can see this sort of empty space. Because it's added in fragments, we have these gaps. And so then what we have is we have a special enzyme called DNA ligase. And you can see that indicated by this sort of blue bubble right here. That DNA ligase is going to come through and it's actually going to fill in 
those gaps so we can have one continuous piece of DNA. So again, these enzymes, which we had talked about again in our previous screencast, are very, very important. Now, a couple I did not mention here is um, topoisomerase. Then we have these single-strand binding proteins. So basically, these single-strand binding proteins, if you recall from the previous video, their job is simply to stabilize that replication fork that was created. In other words, make sure it stays open. The topoisomerase, which is indicated by this green um, circle right here, its job is to stabilize the DNA strand in a way where it does not sort of kink up. You got to remember, when we had our strand, we had basically replication bubbles that were occurring in different areas of that linear strand. Well, if you think about it, if you go to pull on each side and untwist and basically open up, basically open up the strand, as you continue to open up, you're going to end up with some kinking that's going to occur on each end. The topoisomerase is going to help to stabilize that and make sure that that kinking doesn't occur. And I think I already mentioned the helicase, but remember the helicase is simply there and it's indicated by this blue triangle is simply there to help to break the hydrogen bonds that are formed between those nitrogen bases and essentially untwist that DNA strand so it can be prepared and ready for DNA replication. So another thing we need to understand when it comes down to DNA replication is that proofreading is going to become very important because occasionally mistakes do occur and those mistakes do need to be repaired. Now DNA re polymerase is going to be responsible for basically proofreading and helping to correct any incorrect nucleotides that have been placed. Now we have two different types of repair here. We have one that's going to focus primarily on base pairing mistakes. In other words, if we have an A and a T, for example, that should have been paired together, but for whatever reason, maybe instead of a T, we add a C, a mismatch repair will occur with that DNA polymerase and basically just replace that C with the correct T. Down here towards the bottom, we have something called nucleotide excision repair. So sometimes we're going to have damaged stretches of DNA, in other words, more than just a single base pairing. And we have a special enzyme called nuclease that can actually come in, cut out that particular stretch of DNA, and then of course DNA polymerase will come through and replace it and correct the mistake that has been made. Now a lot of these mistakes sometimes can have actually environmental um, influences. In other words, they can be caused by things that are in the environment. And so a lot of things we would experience, for example, various chemicals, um, radioactive emissions, for example, um, exposure to x-rays, definitely UV light, and then of course a good example would be cigarette smoke. So as replication continues, what we need to understand is that um, replicating the ends of the DNA molecule can, can be kind of difficult. So there are some limitations to the DNA polymerase. Now what we're looking at here is we're actually looking at those limitations occurring on the lagging strand. Now the reason for that is this. When you look at the example over here off to the right, you're going to notice, remember, that with the lagging strand we have to introduce those primers because as we introduce those primers, that gives the DNA polymerase basically an indicator as to where it needs to add nucleotides. And remember, when we take away those primers, we have those gaps between those Okazaki fragments. And that's when ligase is going to come in and actually repair or basically fill in those gaps. But what we need to remember is towards the end of replication, we're going to end up with a primer. Now remember that primer is going to be removed. And so when that primer is removed, we actually get a strand of DNA, and if you look right here, that is going to be shorter than the template strand. And so this is going to cause a problem. So it says the usual replication machinery doesn't provide any way to complete the five prime end. And so what's going to happen is when you have repeated rounds of replication, that particular um, strand of DNA is going to get shorter and shorter and shorter. And so if you notice up here, we remove the primers, this five prime end is going to be a bit shorter than you see over here. If we do another round of replication, again, with that leading and lagging strand, remember the lagging strand, again, is going to have an end. It's going to be that RNA primer. And if we do another replication, again, it just continues to get shorter and shorter and shorter. Well, the good thing about this is that towards the end of replication, towards the end of those um, segments, there's really not a lot of... Um, active genetic material, in other words, genes that would be incredibly important um, to the organism. So the loss of those ends actually, for the most part, isn't that big of a deal. But you do need to understand that as that replication continues, there is a shortening in that DNA strand. So because we have, um, again, that continued shortening of that DNA strand, 
we have um, at their ends a nucleotide sequence called a telomere. Now, telomeres do not prevent the shortening. In other words, it's not going to keep that shortening from occurring, but what they do is they do help to sort of postpone the erosion of any genes near the ends of DNA molecules. It has actually been proposed that the shortening of telomeres is actually connected to aging. And so if you look down here towards the bottom, everything that you see highlighted right here, these would be the telomere ends of these chromosomes. And so if you think about the DNA that's been produced, remember, as you go through each replication, on that lagging strand with that RNA primer in place, when you remove it, you have a shorter strand. And after you get repeated replications over a period of time, the strand gets shorter and shorter. And as we said, eventually you are going to run into some genes that would probably be important to the organism. And of course, when you run into those genes, it compromises what those genes are supposed to do. Now, if chromosomes of germ cells do become shorter in every cell cycle, um, you got to think about this, that essentially the genes would eventually start to become missing um, from the gametes that are being produced. In other words, if that gamete was used in reproduction, not all of the genetic material would be there. But there is a special enzyme called telomerase, which is going to catalyze the lengthening of those telomeres in germ cells. So even in our somatic cells, where repeated replication is going to continue to shorten that DNA, in our reproductive cells, like sperm and egg, this particular enzyme is going to help to sort of fix that. And so even somebody who is of advanced age and, of course, produces gametes to produce children, that telomerase is going to come through and basically fix the um, shortening of that DNA strand. So in other words, the telomeres of germ cells are going to be essentially normal. So there have been some studies that have shown that the shortening of telomeres might actually protect the cells from cancerous growth by limiting the number of cell divisions that can actually occur. But there is also evidence that the telomerase activity in cancer cells, so in other words, the activity of that enzyme, actually might allow cancer cells to persist. So what we're going to look at next is we're going to look at an actual chromosome. So we need to think about how that chromosome is actually put together. So we need to think about a chromosome as consisting of DNA, and that DNA is going to be very tightly packed with protein. So the bacterial chromosome is going to be a double-stranded circular strand of DNA. And again, it's going to be associated with a small amount of protein. Um, the eukaryotic chromosome, on the other hand, in other words, the cells that make up who we are, they have a linear DNA molecule, and it's going to be associated with a large amount of protein. So these are two very important differences between eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. In bacteria, the DNA is going to be supercoiled, and it's going to be found in a region that's going to be called the nucleoid. Chromatin, which is a word that we've often used when we talk about chromosomes, is going to be a complex of DNA and protein, and it's going to be found in the nucleus of eukaryotic cells. So when you think about a cell and you're looking at it through a microscope and you see the nucleus, sometimes you'll see this very finely grained material that's going to be found inside of that nucleus. There's really not a lot of organization to it, and so that is what we refer to as chromatin. Now, the name of the proteins are going to be associated with that DNA. That's going to be the histones. And so they're going to be responsible for the very first level of DNA packing in that chromatin. So what you see here is just a couple of diagrams that help to illustrate the structure um, of that chromosome. So if you notice, we're going to start with the DNA. And as we had said, that DNA is going to be in the form of a double helix. We're also going to associate some numbers with this. So we have the DNA being approximately 2 nanometers in diameter. And then if you notice, we're going to have the histones, which are represented by these purple structures you see right here. Um, those histones are going to have DNA that's going to wrap around a set of eight histones. Now, when you have a histone in a group of eight with DNA wrapped around it, it's going to be called a nucleosome. And that nucleosome is going to be around 10 nanometers. Now, if you look down here towards the bottom, you're going to notice that that 10 nanometer um, nucleosome is going to begin to coil on itself. And you can kind of see that up here um, in this diagram. And so as that coiling begins, you're going to find that the diameter of that fiber is going to start to increase, which would make sense because, remember, we're having that material sort of condense. In other words, bring it together. And that makes it appear bigger. And so in this case, this particular fiber is going to be around 30 nanometers. And then if you notice, the material is going to continue to loop or coil. And as it continues, we're going to get these loops that are going to form. And you can kind of see these loops down here. They're going to be basically, um, basically forming on this scaffolding that you see right here. And right here in this diagram, you can kind of see the scaffolding right there. And then as this looping continues, as this extreme coiling continues, we're going to end up with a 300 nanometer 
fiber. And then as we continue to coil, as we continue to supercoil, eventually we're going to make our way to a replicated chromosome, and that's going to be around 1,400 nanometers. Now remember, when we talk about chromosomes, we have basically two main parts. We have the metal part, which is going to be called the centromere, and then of course each side is going to represent a chromatin. Remember, we talk about these as being sister chromatids because this is considered a replicated chromosome. So most of the chromatin is going to be loosely packed in the nucleus, and this is going to be during interphase. So remember, during interphase, we have G1, S, and G2. This is the phase where basically growth is occurring. If we're getting ready to replicate, then we're going to get um, replication of the DNA occurred during the S phase, and of course during G2, we get um, structures that are going to be produced that are going to prepare for mitosis. Loosely packed or uncondensed chromatin is going to be called by a special name, and we're going to call it euchromatin. Now in this case we consider this active DNA and it's simply active because um, remember the DNA is responsible for basically um, um, telling the cell what it needs to do or what it needs to produce and so the, all of the information that is there um, is giving instruction to that cell and all of this is taking place because of a process called transcription and that has to do with protein synthesis. So in other words the entire genetic code um, can be read in this euchromatin state. In other words, we can read the genes, we can look at the sequence of the A's, the T's, the C's, and the G's, we know what it's telling us, and that information can be taken to the ribosomes where the protein can be made so that protein can be used to do the job that it needs to do. Now, during interphase, there is going to be a few regions of chromatin, in other words, centromeres and telomeres, that are going to be very highly condensed, and this is going to be condensed into something called heterochromatin. Now this is going to be considered inactive DNA. Because of the dense packing of the heterochromatin, because of that packing, it makes it very difficult to read um, the DNA. So you don't have the transcription occurring. And so in other words, the ability to express that genetic information, in other words, to be able to create those proteins, is going to be extremely compromised. All right, so that's going to finish up this second and final screencast for Chapter 16. As always, please make sure that you have completed your screencast study guide.